Welcome to the 99th episode of the Reading and Writing Podcast. I'm your host, Jeff Rutherford. Stay tuned for my interview with John Horner Jacobs, author of the novels Southern Gods, This Dark Earth, and The Twelve Finger Boy. Stay tuned for the interview. Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is John Horner Jacobs, author of the new zombie novel, This Dark Earth. John, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. Sure. First, can I ask you to read the first three or four paragraphs of This Dark Earth? Okay. Uh, This will be my first live performance. All right. Um, Genesis. It was a family once, Lucy saw. And maybe they fit together like puzzle pieces when whole, mother and father pressed together, the boy nestled between them. But now they were broken, a thin, gibbering wail coming from the child thrashing on the hospital floor, the mother frantic and pawing at his narrow chest, choking up sobs and great heaves, grappling for his flailing arms, while the father stood helplessly, opening and closing his hands into fists, as if wishing for something to fight. Help me. It wasn't a scream but more alarming because of the lowered tone and urgency of the woman. The man dropped to his knees and took the boy's wrist in his big, raw-boned hands. He was a laborer, that was clear, black-haired and thick of waist. The boy shared his looks, dark hair and sturdy build from what Lucy could see beyond the wreckage of the young face. Lucy stepped closer. The child had swallowed his own lips and was now trying to gnaw off his fingertips. She paused to set down her coffee on the nurse's station and move towards the grizzly trio. Great. Well, if the listeners haven't heard about This Dark Earth before, how would you describe the novel? I would describe it as... um, It is is a post-apocalyptic coming-of-age story. Um, It's about... It's pretty much about a family um, who tries to reestablish civilization on a bridge in Arkansas after a nuclear, you know, post nuclear war zombie apocalypse situation, and um, it, it, you know, about a, a, the first third of the book is pretty much a standard zombie novel, and then from there it takes sort of a left turn and goes into more of an examination of civilization and what makes civilization Mm -hmm. and what makes, you know, and how, you know, you give up things for order and you have to sacrifice things to keep it. Um, And and, in a lot of ways, it is um, not, you know, it's pretty much marketed as horror, but it's not really horror it is. It deals with more of the things that maybe a science fiction author would think about, right? Um, to me, um, but it, because it has zombies, it's you know, <laughs> it, you know, it, it it gets filed in the horror, and that's fine because you know it, it does have some horrific elements, so. right? Well, well, speaking of zombies, for for horror fans, zombies have been around for many years, but zombies have just really exploded in popular culture over the last three or four years. You have The Walking Dead, both the comic book and the successful TV show, and also lots of different novels and movies as well. When you started writing This Dark Earth, were were you were you intimidated at all, or or uh, maybe leery to to bring in zombies? You know, honestly, um, when I started writing this, I was uh, I, I started writing it, I guess, in two thousand early two thousand and eight. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I had read. Um, I'd always been a big fan of sort of apocalyptic, uh, apocalyptic, um, you know, n- n- literature and sure. movies. Mm-hmm. A- and um, I had read, I guess, a couple of years before Brian Keene's The Rising. And then, and, and I loved it because it was very just fast moving and, and sort of, you know, it was pulpy, you know, and it was it was a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. And it sort of reinvented the zombie. And then I had then just finished reading The Road, and I had that in my head, and I was like, I sort of, you know, I sort of mixed those together in in my mind, and, and I just thought, well, you know, here's here's the story I would want to tell if I was telling those stories. 
you know, this is, you know, I, I'm not, I don't live in a big city. I live in Arkansas. And part of my thing was, um, you know, if the sort of traditional zombie, uh, uh, the Romero zombie, not, not a voodoo, but a Romero zombie you know, event happened, Arkansas really wouldn't have a problem because we have a very low population density and we have a very uh, huge gun culture. <laughs> There's, <laughs> you know, I mean, in, in like Arkansas, like think about Arkansas or Montana, you know, or, you know, any place with low population densities that, that most people are, are agricultural, agriculturally based, those are gun cultures. And, you know, the, the zombies rise, it's not going to be a big problem because there's not that many people and they're re- remotely situated. In, in Arkansas, we, we are protected by a lot of rivers. So, you know, there's no, you know, you cut a few bridges and no one's getting in from the, no zombies are crossing the Mississippi. So anyway, so I, I, I may, started thinking about like the actual logistics of what would happen. So I had to make it a little bit worse in Arkansas by um, doing, you know, uh, sort of a nuclear holocaust along with it, uh, a limited nuclear exchange. Right, right. Um, so so, so in, w- w- in terms of zombies, why do you think zombies continue to fascinate people? Is there something about that archetype that, that resonates with, with people, especially today, given, you know, everything that's going on in, in our culture? Yes, I think uh, there's a few things. On on the one hand, uh, this as always, as you see with like Romero movies, they are sort of uh, uh, zombies are a blank slate, and because they're humans, you can make a lot of statements about human behavior by what you have the zombies do. You know, so if they're in a, a shopping mall, you can make a comment on um, consumerism. Um, if I, I think personally, this is the a theory that I've just been de- developing is that zombies are a sort of uh, cultural, the, the interest in zombies are a cultural uh, sort of, an, uh, it's an upwelling of our collective fear of cancer, uh, is what I, I think. Because zombies, to me, um, they, they look like, you know, I mean, they're dead, so um, they sort of, you know, what the sort of stylized ideal of what a cancer might look like <laughs> if, it, if transmogrified into a, a, or anthropomorphized into a human might look like a zombie, but also they're a cancer in the body of humanity. They're eating humanity as a whole from the inside out. If that makes any sense. No, no it, know, it does. I, it does. It's I, interesting. I hadn't thought about it from that perspective. And, and honestly, I didn't, I didn't think about that consciously but cancer is a major thing in this dark earth because of the nuclear strikes. Um, the radiation uh, has, you know, it, it causes, it starts causing cancer in the populace. Um, and I didn't realize it, but I was sort of blending that. I was sort of developing that idea as I wrote the book. Um, I think also like zombies that I think all, all the, Popularity of zombies is also because, uh, for the last you know thirty years, you know our corporate culture has been marginalizing the middle class, and um, zombies are sort of a direct uh, outpouring of like an idea of, of sort of a, a sort of collective revenge drama, sure. you know. Um, and th- those are a few things. I mean, and then they're also just. I mean, to me. Uh, when I read, I guess one of the real things that sort of charged me on the zombies is when I read Brian Keene's uh, book and I, I uh, watched, even before that, like the, the remake of Dawn of the Dead, I remember just how scary zombies are or how much they frighten me personally. And, and it's funny because I tell that to my family. I'm like, you know, I, I, they really sort of freak me out. And, uh, you know, I was at a convention with this one there, and I've written a book on zombies. And it's sort of like I'm putting myself in harm's way because I go to conventions and you know people want me to be on all zombie stuff, and I'll see people done in like totally realistic zombie makeup, and and really be uncomfortable around them. Yeah, because yeah. I I just you know <laughs> so I read because they uh, you know they they sort of creep me out. Gotcha. 
So, so what was the what was the path to publication like for you with your first novel, Southern Gods and This Dark Earth? Did you always want to write, and did you write short stories before you started writing novels? Yes, I um, I I. I had wanted to be a, a, you know, I was always a bookworm growing up, and I'd always wanted to be an author when I was a kid, but I never really had the discipline. Though when I was in college, I went to like the Bennington Writers Workshop. This is in the early '90s, and wrote a bunch, a series of like very sort of literary stories about dog fighting in Arkansas. And it, you know, I was very much under the shadow of you know William Faulkner writing long paragraphs with very obscure words and. I mean, I love Faulkner, but I mean, that was, I was just totally emulating him. And then after I graduated from college, you know, the real world set in, I had to get a job and I had to go back to school to get something I could actually make a living with other than an English degree. And then 17, 18 years later, I find, you know, I have kids, I've settled down. I finally, like, I was 37 and I said, well, you know, I, I have an idea for a book and I've always wanted to write a book and I'm 37. If I don't do it now, when am I ever going to do it? I'm never going to do it. I mean, I'll just sort of wish for the rest of my life. So I entered the National Novel Writing Month in 2007 and wrote the first half of first 50,000 words of Southern Gods. Over the next five months, I finished it and polished it. Um, over the next two years, sometime in the next two years, I got an agent. Mm -hmm. um, and then the first book she had read or the one that she had been interested in was uh, This Dark Earth, and we shopped it around, and there wasn't a lot of bites because a lot of people, um, you know, it, it, at the time, zombies were really taking off, and I guess all the houses were swamped with zombie books. Right. And I thought, you know, it, This Dark Earth is, is a real sort of strange one because it is, um, it is traditional in the sense that it doesn't try to reinvent zombies or do anything else, and so the first part of the book is just sort of a your standard fair zombie novel. But then it sort of takes, you know, like I said earlier, it, it goes to other places um, that most zombie novels don't, where it's, it's more about society. And um, and so I was very lucky. Um, but So that was out at publishers, and then she, but it wasn't getting a lot of traction. And a lot of publishers are just sitting on it because it's a good book. It was, you know, I, I'm, I love the book. It's, it's, it's my book. It's a good book. But there was just so many zombie novels out there. They weren't just jumping on it and buying it right away. And so my agent uh, sent out my uh, my first novel to other publishers, and it got snapped up like in a month from um, from a large independent press, Nightshade. Um, and it's gone on to do really well. I mean, it's selling, still selling, you know, really well, and. Um, you know, we were nominated for the Bram Stoker Award, and um, and then right when that one was coming out, um, Jen Heddle, uh, who now is the head, uh, I think, editor, chief editor at Lucasfilms, um, bought, acquired it for us from Gallery, and um, that's sort of the story of that. And right at the same time, also, my young adult trilogy sold, so... It was a really good, it was a really, last summer was a really good summer, because I had a book coming out, I got a deal, and then I got a three book deal with uh, Learner Publishing for a young adult series, and uh, so, I, I, I really was very happy. <laughs> so, so tell me a little bit about the young adult series, that hasn't been published uh, yet, correct? No, it's not, we're, I, we finished with all the edits and everything, and I, you know, I've seen copies of the, the cover. And uh, I'm sure they're probably in layout or whatever. The Young Adult is, uh, trilogy is called the Incarcerado Trilogy, but it's about, um, the first one is called The Twelve-Fingered Boy. And it's about, uh, it's about incarcerated juvenile delinquents who discover, or, or, or a, a incarcerated juvenile delinquent who's assigned a new cellmate that he discovers uh, has polydactylism. Uh, which is you know, an extra finger on both hands. He has 12 fingers. And it's possible that he has superpowers. Um, and uh, a man from the, supposedly a man from the, the Department of Health and Human Services shows up uh, asking questions, and, um, re and it, it becomes obvious that, you know, things are are not what they appear. 
right eventually the boys and so it's like a I, here's the way i pitch it and a lot of people don't really get it um but it's it's like a mashup between escape from alcatraz and escape from Mitch, which mountain <laughs> which is <laughs> awful. that's but great modern sense of um, so, so was it different for you writing YA novels compared to Southern Gods in this dark earth? Um, you know, people always ask that. Uh, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I, you know, writing is writing. I, I realize. I mean, I, I read a lot of young adult stuff because a lot of times that it is a, more considered and better written than a lot of adult work. Um, you know, I, I had realized from my reading of young adult stuff that uh, some of the rules, like you can't, you know, young adult, if you tell, if, if it's a story told from a remove, like say uh, True Grit, if you, if you take True Grit, True Grit would be a modern day young adult novel mm -hmm. if it wasn't about reminiscing about things that happened when they were a, ch a child. You sort of have to put the character in the shit and it just be there experiencing it right then. Um, and so that was one of the reasons why I chose to write The Twelve Finger Boy in present tense, which is a lot of people are writing in present tense now, and it's sort of in, in vogue or somewhat in vogue now. Um, but I, I had written uh, Southern Gods in sort of the traditional third person. Um, in This Dark Earth, my original idea of This Dark Earth was it was going to be a mosaic novel along the lines of the things they carried where each, it would be a series of stories that tell the overarching story, but, um, and with the same characters, but it's just different points of view. And, and that's how it worked, but it wasn't a lot of stories. It was like six sections. And I've had some complaints that it's like, the, the chapters are too damn long. And, and I'm like, well, they're not really chapters, they're sections. So Right. Well, well I know that you helped start a noir magazine, Needle. What has that experience been like for you? Do you feel that editing improved your own writing? Well, I was not the editor. I was, you know, I, I, what I did, um, and I am, I've had to sort of, uh, off from that, uh, I was a co-founder. I was the creative director. So that meant I did, I designed the cover and I did the typesetting and I did all the layout. Gotcha. And I picked out the photos and, and established the look because that's, that is my. That is what I do for a living. Is I'm I'm a graphic animator, um, you know, uh, you know, video editor. I mean, I'm I'm a graphic, and you know, I I worked as like creative director at ad agencies. I, that's what I do for a living. So that was my contribution. Um, however, I, I I the experience was invaluable. It just unfortunately, it just recently. I've had to get, uh, you know, I had to resign from being the creative director because I just had too many things on my plate, sure. of which a lot of it is. And then I've I also uh, maybe a little bit prematurely left my job to do freelance uh, design work. And uh, so so I just didn't have time to, to do the magazine because the magazine took about 40 hours of my time per um, issue. Sure. There was three sure. issues a, a so that was a considerable amount of time um, that I that, that I did totally unpaid. Right, right. So, so what tips or advice would you offer for aspiring writers, given your experience thus far? Um, I'd say read thousands of books. <laughs> you know, and, <laughs> and subsume uh, subsume good storytelling and and some bad storytelling. You know. Um, I would also say that people uh, focus on um, focus on action sometimes because they think that draws in the reader. I I've always been a. I've always, my contention is um, a lot of what gets people to keep reading is the, the uh, is a feeling of security when they read the author and a, uh, uh, that they know what they're doing. That they. Uh, you know, are a master at what they're doing. And a lot of that comes from tone and style. Um, so, you know, I, I can't tell you in, in workshops, I can tell you how many times I read like the first, you know, someone says, always oh, start with action. And I, and someone writes this and it's like, you know, you know, Captain Sandra, whatever races down the hall, you know, like they start off immediately describing some action. 
And I think that's not probably the best advice. What I would say is write a perfect, you know, like consider your opening and try to get your theme involved in it and start with a great image and do that in a, in a way that uh, is totally unique to you so that when the reader opens your, you know, uh, story uh, or book and they see that, they have a feeling that you are totally in control of this situation, of this bit of literature, and they feel comfortable to relax and, al- and, and, and confident that you will uh, fulfill the expectation of, of, of that image or a phrase or paragraph. Does that make any sense? Like, yeah, yeah, it does. It's, it's a trust issue with the reader, and they need to feel like you're in charge and a master of what you can do. And, and even though you might not be a master, but a lot of that comes from style and um, the, the way you um, put sentences together. Um, right. And then you have to have a good story. So many things. And then uh, on a more sort of macro level, I would say uh, if you're a writer starting out, and you're trying to t- write to market, like you, you think, oh, okay, this is hot now, like, um, and you're not writing something that just that re- that you enjoy and that interests you. You're making a, a huge mistake. Because first off, uh, I, I would have a real tough time writing something that I did not enjoy because it's a long. You have a long relationship with a work of of uh, fiction that you're writing, and it should be something that really get you know you it excites you. Right, and the second thing is uh, writing the market is. I, I I can't think of anyone who's who, um, does that well. Um, I mean, some people write the market, but it's because they enjoy the exact same things that the market is buying, and uh, so I, I think you should just follow uh, the, the saying is follow your bliss, and write what you feel like, and uh, sure, you know, that, that's. So, so what what books, fiction or nonfiction, have you read lately that made an impact on you and that you would recommend? That that made an impact, or or um, that or that or that you particularly enjoyed. That I really enjoyed. Well, you know, I've actually had a real hard. Can you hear me? Yeah, I, I've actually had a real hard time um, getting into books uh, recently. Now that I've started. Um, now that I've become a writer, it's really hard because it, it sort of – it makes me more mercenary when I'm reading something. Like what can I take – like how are they doing this and what can I take from it and, and, and subsume it in my own writing? And it's been, it's, been, uh, it's been a long time since I've read a book in pure enjoyment. However, I guess the most exciting reading experience I've had in the past year has been – well, let me just preface this. I read a. Uh, I tried reading a book by China Mieville mm-hmm. called Perdido Street Station, and I got about halfway through it, and it just it just didn't work. It, it, the writing was clunky and pretentious and uh, overly verbose, and it. I just kept putting it down and just like leaving it for a month, and not really. Uh, but everyone was raving about how incredible it was. And I'd go back and I'd read a little bit more and it just would immediately put me to sleep. So I finally just threw it away. And, uh, and then someone gave me a copy of The Scar. And I was like, well, I, I had a really terrible time with, with, with the first one. I, I mean, I rarely get a book where I can't read the whole thing if it you know, has something in it. But I opened The Scar and it was just it was everything produced uh, street station was not it was exciting there had characters with believable motivations it you know it was just while the first one but while Purdue street station had incredible imagery and you know really interesting writing with lots and lots of polysyllabic uh, 64 dollar words this one had the same thing but it worked for me it just it, and, and I read it and I was totally transported in the book, and it was, and it's actually like, and I would consider it one of my favorite books. Um, and that's probably the best reading I've, I've been doing now. I'm, I'm sort of right now. I've been slowly working through Cormac McCarthy's Sutri, uh, which is, I don't know, I have some problems with it, but um, <laughs> you know, it's funny because he's like Pulitzer Prize winning novelist and everything, but 
it's very much emulative of William Faulkner, and I guess because I've tried to get out from underneath that shadow, I, I'm very sensitive to other people who are still who write in pure emulation of it, and it's it is. Um, but you know, it, 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 much like the Perdido Street Station, it has brilliant imagery and brilliant turns of phrase, and, and, and so I keep I keep trying to read it, <laughs> but that's what I'm. <laughs> right now and gotcha. uh so so what what are you working on right now what are you writing i'm writing the second book in the in uh young adult trilogy called uh it, it is called incarcerado and it's it, it has been it's been i've never written a sequel to a book so i didn't really you know i didn't some of the problems i encountered were one this is number two so i have the sort of uh, two towers issue which is how do you make the second book in a trilogy engaging on its own i don't know if i've solved that i think i might have the, uh, the second problem is it's like okay in a series i've written three individual books four i've actually written four individual books this uh, my my fourth one hasn't found a home yet but we're looking we're we're, we're very hopeful about one place um, and how do you make it, uh, interesting to me? How, how do I, you know, what am I going to get out of this relationship with this, the second book that I'm going to be with for months? You, you know, that's a very important question that every author needs to ask themselves is, is like, you have to live with these characters and you have to live with this work and, and dealing with it every day for months on end. You know what? What is what? What is going to make it interesting for you? <laughs> you know, as a, a, a mental exercise and a, a, an artistic pursuit. So that was another thing I had to really sort of sit down and think about. Um, and those are the two big things I've had to hurt. Uh, the hurdles I had to jump over. I'm ver coming very close to the end. It is getting a little bit bigger than I thought it would be. So, and then I know I'm going to have some a good amount of rewrites. But um, I'm almost done with that one, and then I'll be finishing the third. One. I'll be writing the third one immediately after that. Right. Uh, the, so, Twelve Fingered Boy comes out uh, next spring, uh, 2013, and then and then they come out. The, the 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 next book comes out 2014, and the next book comes out 2015. And so we're hoping my my other series that that is on the market right now is called The Incorruptibles, and it's sort of my Baby, it's my favorite thing I've ever written. It's a, and it's very strange, you know, sort of amalgam of things I, I love. Um, it's it's a Western fantasy set in a in a world like our own, and except it's in a empire like sort of based on the Roman Empire, as if it never fell. And so they're they're sort of at the point of the Industrial Revolution where they're pushing westward into we call it the Imperial Protectorate, or I call it the Imperial Protectorate, or the Hard Scrabble Territories, Tories, which which is pretty much a a, a, um, a, a stand-in for early you know Western expansion into America, and sort of the 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 the, the thing about this book is it is um, the world is powered by infernal combustion, so the big steamships and mechanized baggage trains that have uh, great flaming demons bound in their bellies that push turbines. Um, so there's sort of this magic element. Um, and, and so the Western derives from um, uh, this sort of uh, uh, equite class that have guns that you know, each bullet uh, guns are these guns are very expensive because each bullet has to be, have a summoner or what I call an engineer bind an imp inside the bullet and the bullets are warded and so when you pull like you have your pistol when you pull back the, the hammer on the pistol and you pull the trigger the hammer falls forward mars the warding allowing the imp to sort of combust and, and run free pushing the barrel the, the bullet down the barrel and so you have these, you know, so it works as a Western. So, um, my, and my agent gave it the title Demon Punk, which I'm, I'm okay with, you know, I've been called punk lots of times. So that, that sounds it, fun. That sounds like lots of fun. So, so good luck with that. Where, where can, where can people find you online? They can find me on Twitter at John Horner, 
and my my name is spelled H O R N O R. It's exactly like horror, actually, except uh, strike the second R and replace with an N. John Horner, all one word, all lowercase, or I guess it really matter on Twitter. And then um, on my website, which is johnhornerjacobs.com. Great. Well, again, we've been speaking with John Horner Jacobs, author of the new horror novel, This Dark Earth. The book is available in bookstores now. John, thanks for doing the interview. Oh, thank you, Jeff. I really appreciate it. With MailChimp, you get more than a URL. You get an all-in-one marketing platform to help drive sales. With things like data-driven recommendations and powerful automation tools. Get started today at MailChimp.com slash smart marketing. MailChimp, built for growing businesses. Tis the season for those irresistible ginger thins, cozy blankets for cuddling by the fire, and making home warm and welcoming. For one-stop holiday shopping, visit your local IKEA or ikea-usa.com slash holiday.